starting today called Reply All. And what it is, is on Easter Sunday, uh, Pastor Brian uh, preached an incredible word, but in his word, he gave all of us uh, cards in a church and had us fill it out. And it was basically for us as a pastoral staff to see where you are on your faith journey. And for all of you that filled those out, thank you so much. Um, They've been such a great resource for us to know what you guys need. And us as pastors, our heart is not that we're just taking you on a deeper journey in your faith, but we want to bring messages that help equip you for your everyday life. And so that's what our hope is. And so this series is literally the series that you asked for. And the most requested topic, the things that you guys filled out on your cards that Easter Sunday that you wanted to know more about is work. And so, you know, the song, work, 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 work. Three of you. Thank you. That's, that's all I could think of uh, whenever I was sermon prepping. That's what I was thinking of. But we're going to be in First Chronicles 14.2. And it says this, David now realized why the Lord had made him king and why he had made his kingdom so great. It was for a special reason, to give joy to God's people. If you're taking notes today, and I hope you are, because we have a saying here at One Church that paper never forgets. Can you title this message, Nobody Else is Coming? Nobody else is coming. Can I pray as we continue our time together? Father, I just thank you for every person. Lord, right now we just lean into what you say. And Lord, I declare this is a God-appointed word at a God-appointed time. Father, I declare every ear is open and receptive. Every heart will be softened for the seed of the word of God. I declare every life changed in Jesus' name. And every person who believed it said, amen, amen. Um, I really do love working out. Um, I remember people used to say that, and I would roll my eyes at them and not understand how they could enjoy working out. But I I really do love working out. And it's not just for my physical body, especially the season that we've walked through um, with the loss of Brian's mom and so many things that we've gone through in the last two years. It's become like my very breath. Like I, I need to work out. It's good for me mentally. It's good for the battle that I've had with depression and anxiety and Um, It's so good for me. In fact, most of my messages will start out something like this. I was on a run the other day and the Lord spoke to me. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Uh, It's actually the place that God always meets me. I think it's because it's the place that nobody else can reach me. And so God finally is able to speak. It's not that he's more present on my county roads. It's just that I am more disconnected um, than anywhere else. And so uh, with that, there comes this common misconception. Whenever people get with me, they're like, oh, we have Pastor Crystal here. We got to eat somewhere healthy. I'm sure you want a salad. I'm like, you don't know me. Uh, your girl, your girl works out, but I love, I love McDonald's. Y'all, I love McDonald's so much. Like, I love McDonald's. In fact, like, if you really know me, you know, like, when I pass McDonald's, most of the time I will see the arches and I'll just have to say, I love McDonald's because it just makes me so happy even when I see it. I I love McDonald's. And so, uh, in fact, if you're my friend, uh, the only way you can be my friend is if you have a go-to McDonald's order. If you're one of those people that likes to pretend they don't eat McDonald's, we can't be friends Um, because this is a no-shame zone. Like, I want to be able to eat my McDonald's um, without judgment. Any McDonald's lovers here? This is a safe place. Yes, I see you. I see you. I love you. I'm for you. Let's start a community group where we meet up at McDonald's, eat fries and Big Macs. Amen. And, uh, but I love McDonald's. And, and here's the crazy thing is everybody acts like they don't eat McDonald's, but yet somehow they sell $2.3 billion worth of Big Macs alone every year. Y'all, that's a lot of Big Macs. That is a lot of Big Macs. So we're all pretending like we don't eat them, but we do. In fact, Americans are obsessed with fast food that we spend $50 billion a year annually on fast food. That is a whole lot of money on fast food. And, and I think about this, and the reason why we are obsessed with uh, fast food in our culture is because we don't have time, right? We don't have time to cook good meals. But here's the thing is I've never had a memorable fast food experience, Uh, I can't look back over my life and say the most memorable moments or the most memorable meals I've had were McDonald's. Even though I do love McDonald's, um, the most memorable meals I've had were things like Thanksgiving, Christmas, 
Easter. Why? Because those meals, everybody's together and they take days to prepare the food, but we're all together and we're all around a table and we're hanging out. And I, and I began to think about this, that if our obsession with fast food remained with fast food, it would be one thing. But I've got a saying that the way you do anything is the way you do everything. And, and the sad part is our mentality with fast food creeps into our everyday life. In fact, uh, millennials and Gen Xers, uh, this is a cuss word that I'm about to say. So just pause as I cuss in church process. Yeah, we don't like the word process. We want everything instant. We want everything right now. We don't want process. And so we want so we want what we want. We want it as fast as we can get it. Thus, we have Amazon Prime. And then if Amazon Prime's not enough, we have Amazon Now. And, and we want next day shipping. And here's the thing is that with God, there is no drive through breakthroughs. There is no drive through anointing stations. There is no drive through discipleship class, but we want everything that God has for us and we want to go around the process and get it. And that's why in the Gen Xers and millennials, uh, we move from job to job to job. In fact, old school ways, people got a job and they stayed there until they retired. No longer is that the case. Millennials, um, that is people 25 to 40, the figure is that they will be at a job for two years and nine months. While Gen Xers stay at a job an average of five years and two months, where boomers spent eight years and three months at a job. We are almost four times shorter now in our job length of time. I, when I talk to employers, they say that the greatest problem right now is hiring people. In fact, I was talking to a, a friend of mine, a business owner um, that I've done some coaching with, and he said, Crystal, the crazy part is people wanna make $30 an hour and they have no qualifications. And they want to show up whenever they want to show up and they want to do whatever they want to do and they don't want to take out the trash and they don't want to do any grunt work. And he goes, I would love to make $30 an hour. Why am I going to pay you $30 an hour when I'm the business owner? And I'm like, dude, that's realistic expectations. And isn't it sad that everybody wants something for nothing? And really what it is is we have a whole generation that doesn't want to go through process. We see everything everybody has on Instagram and we want their life without having to go through their process. We want their cars and so this is what we do. We rack up credit card debt because we're not in love with being rich, we're just in love with looking rich. And we can't sleep at night and we're on anxiety meds because we have medicated ourselves with things. That's a whole nother message. But I, I found this, that in life, that God will either show me the mountaintop and not the path or he will show me the path and not the mountaintop. Meaning this, that God will ever either give you the big vision of where you're going in your life and you have to trust him for every single step or he'll just keep telling you the next step without you being fully clear of where it is that he's taking you. But both situations, it involves us being willing to go through the process that God has for us. In Genesis chapter two, uh, the sin that we see with Adam and Eve, how the sin happened is this, is that all that Satan had to do is to convince Adam and Eve that contentment existed beyond what God had given them. And that is why we move from job to job, from relationship to relationship, from thing to thing, from house to house, from car to car. What is it? It's because we believe the lie that contentment exists beyond what we currently have. And, and I will say this, that if the problem in every job is you hate your boss and you don't like your job and you hate the relationship and they're mean to you, the problem's not the job, the problem's not the relationship, the problem's you. And the, dis the discontentment that you feel is on the inside of you. So you can change jobs, but the discontentment follows you. And it goes with you wherever you are. Max Lucado said this, is that the largest prison, the most populated prison on earth is the prison of discontentment. And that's what I see. I, I see a whole people that are so discontent. And we are so in love where God's taking us next that we despise where we are now. And I wanna tell you that where you are now is God's perfect plan. That where you are now is God's perfect place. That happiness and contentment do not land in tomorrow's place, but they can be found right where you are. What used to be a miracle in your life that now has become common? Remember when you first got that job and you were so excited, you called everybody. You were like, I got the job. This is so amazing. On your first day of work, you couldn't wait to get there. You told your community group how excited you were, and now you despise the job. 
Now you complain about the employer. Now you complain about the benefits. Now you complain about the job duties. Now you complain about it. And here's the thing is that the problem is not your employer. The problem is not your job. The problem is you. Most popular message, Ephesians 6, verse 5. Y'all wanted to talk about work. Work, 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 work. Um, Servants and slaves, be obedient to those who are your physical masters, having respect for them and eager concern to please them, in singleness of motive and with all your heart, as service to Christ himself. Meaning this, you don't have a workplace problem, you have a serving God problem. When you show up to work, you're not serving your employer, you're serving the Lord. When you're late for work, you're not late for whatever your employer is. You're late for the Lord. When you are using employer hours to scroll Facebook and social media, you're not using your employer's hours. You're stealing from the Lord. The Bible says as Christ followers that when we show up to work, we're supposed to serve and honor and uh, pray for our employer as we would the Lord. That sets the standard a whole lot higher, meaning that God has you in the place that you're at for a reason. He, he has you there for a purpose. I, I love what Joyce Meyer says. She says that everybody's sandpaper. Either your sandpaper to somebody or sand, somebody's sandpaper to you, right? And, and meaning this, that God is using that employer that seems difficult to rub the rough edges off of you to prepare you, to equip you, to fashion you. The job you're in right now is preparing you for the next season. See, in the opening scripture, David is looking over his life and he's saying, I'm able to say this. I now realize why the Lord made me king. He made his kingdom so great. It was for a special reason to give joy to God's people. In other words, the special purpose on your life never had anything to do with you. It was always about other people. The purpose was never supposed to be about David becoming great, but it was about God using David to make the people great. And I will tell you that the reason why you're in the place that you are is because God has people there that he wants you to reach. And I just want to tell you that nobody else is coming. Nobody else is coming to that school to pastor those kids. Nobody else is coming to your workplace to start a devotional. Nobody else is coming to that neighborhood to love your neighbors. And what if we begin to love and enjoy Enjoy the season that we're in instead of fighting and praying our way out of it. Here's the thing is that when you read through the New Testament, Paul and Silas and Peter, they never prayed themselves out of situations. They always asked God to use them in the situation. And what I found is we're praying ourselves out of jobs, out of neighborhoods, out of situations. And God's going, I have you there for a special reason. And it's for people. Did it ever occur to you that maybe God has you there because somebody's got a daughter at your workplace that somebody's been praying for for years and you're the person from the Sunday morning message that's supposed to go in and be a light in a darkness. Well, Crystal, you don't know my workplace. Yeah, I do. I, was, I worked in the secular world before I worked here. And I'll say this, that light isn't made for light places. Light is made for dark places. So if your workplace is dark, it's because you're dark. If your workplace is void of God's love, it's because you're not showing it. If your workplace, why? Because nobody else is coming. They're all waiting for you. God is waiting for you to raise up. So David's saying, I'm looking over my life, and I realized this. There was three problems I have to solve. Number one, it's the goat problem. And the goat problem teaches you humility. 1 Samuel 16, 11 says this. And Samuel asks, are these all the sons you have? They're still the youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down and eat until he arrives. See, here's the crazy part, is David gets anointed in front of everybody, and he gets anointed when he had been completely forgotten. He was left out with the sheep and the goats. Here's the wild part, is that the prophet coming to their house, the prophet Samuel coming to their house, this was like a big deal. Like they, they put on a big feast and everybody's excited. And you think about this from David's perspective for a moment. He knew the party was happening. He knew the dinner was coming. He knew one of them was going to be anointed king. And he knew he was being left in the field. Now, if he would have bypassed and decided to come inside and make a place for himself at that table, what it would have done is it would have left the sheep and goats unattended. 
And if the sheep and goats were unattended, that is putting the whole family's livelihood at risk. And so he decided to stay in a place that nobody wanted to be to serve the ultimate goal of providing for the family. He didn't allow jealousy to push himself into rooms that he felt he was deserved or owed. And as he did that, here's the crazy part is, is that there was nobody else anointed to be king. And so they said, is there somebody else? And they said, there's one other person. And, and so they, wait, they waited until David got in the room. Isn't it wild that God can make sure that you can be promoted? You don't have to promote yourself. When you're just willing to be able to take care of the goat problem in life, the thing that nobody else wanted to do, because sheep were profitable, goats were not but both were his responsibility. It was the, the profitability of the sheep, but also the hiddenness, the humility part of the goats. I wanna encourage you that every single one of you have parts of your job that are the sexy part, right? It's the good part of your job. You like that part of your job, but every person's job has the goat part of the job. This is the part of the job we don't love doing. I call it payroll. I hate payroll. I don't like talking to the IRS. I don't like messing with that. But you know what? It's part of my job. It's part of what I do. And you have the part of your job that you enjoy, and you have the part of your job that is hard. But neglecting the hard thing does not get you promoted any quicker. And a lot of times what we do is we love the fun parts. In fact, I, I love this. In the Bible, it tells us a story about Jacob. And Jacob had uh, this girl that he liked, and her name was Rachel. And the Bible says that Rachel was beautiful. And here's the funny part is Rachel had a sister. And you know you're ugly when the Bible calls you ugly. When God himself, he's telling Moses, because Moses is who's the author of Genesis, and he goes, and God's telling Moses, yeah, write down, she was ugly. And Moses goes, wait, God, are, are you sure? And he goes, yeah, she, she had weak eyes. And Moses is like, all right, Lord, I'll write it down. And so you know you're ugly, right? Leah was ugly. And your Bible says this, that uh, Jacob thought he was marrying Rachel. And your Bible says that he woke up the next morning and behold, it was Leah. Now, how are you going to sleep with a girl and then be like, what? Wrong sister. That's a whole nother conversation. And she was ugly. But here's the thing is that Jacob kept going back to her tent. She was ugly, but he kept finding her. And your Bible says that she was fruitful because she kept having child after child after child. And it made me think this. There's some things in our lives, they're not sexy, but they're fruitful. They're, they're not pretty. They're not great on Instagram, but man, they're fruitful. Prayer, it's not sexy, but it's fruitful. Having a daily devotional, it's not sexy, but it's fruitful. Tithing is not sexy, but it's fruitful. There's some things in our life, they're not sexy, but let me just tell you that they're fruitful. Uh, going into your workplace, not with an attitude of I deserve it and what's owed to me isn't sexy, but it's fruitful. Deciding to walk in and say, I'll take out the trash. I'll vacuum. I'll do whatever. It doesn't have to be in my job description. There's no task too big or too small. Have you become too good to do certain things at your work? And if you are, it's because you haven't mastered the goat problem. And, and it's the goat problem that teaches us humility. See, I love this because David is here in this season and he realizes that to get to there, God wants to know if he can trust me here. And so he was just faithful with the sheep and the goats. Are you faithful in the things in your job that you don't like, that you don't enjoy? Or are you just good at doing the parts of your job that you enjoy doing? Are you just good at doing the parts of your relationship with God that you love doing? Or are you faithful to the things that he's asked you to do that are hard doing? This is popular. Number two, the guitar problem. The guitar problem teaches us excellence. In 1 Samuel 14, 14 through 20, it says, Now the spirit of the Lord had left Saul, and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. That will jack up your theology right there. And some of Saul's servants said to him, a tormenting spirit from God is troubling you. Let us find a good musician. Side note, you gotta be good, right? He's like, find a good musician, not just a musician, but a good musician to play the harp. Whenever the tormenting spirit troubles you, he will play soothing music and you will soon be well again. All right, Saul said, find me someone who plays well. In other words, I want somebody skilled. I, I, for those of you that don't know, I was in band for one year and uh, 
I, I played clarinet and the band director told me I was so good. I was in my own band and he put me in a soundproof room um, where I stayed for the rest of the year. That was my only year in band. And so I wasn't talented, did not play well. I never got to play well with others. <laughs> and he says, find me someone who plays well and bring him here. One of the servants said to Saul, he's, ta- he's a talented harp player. Not only that, he is a brave warrior, a man of war and has good judgment. He is also fine looking man. Man, this guy's got a crush on David. And uh, the Lord is with him. So Saul sent messengers to Jesse to say, send me your son, David, the shepherd. Jesse responded by saying David to Saul. Um, uh, Side note, whenever Saul was ready to promote David, he first went to the authority he was submitted to. And when the authority he was submitted to released him, he was able to go into your next season. You want to be released from the authority you're submitted to into your next season. If you don't have their blessing, you shouldn't go. That's a whole nother message. Jesse responded by sending David to Saul along with a young goat, a donkey loaded with bread, and a wineskin full of wine. Isn't it interesting that David shows up with a goat? What he was faithful in stewarding in the last season, he needed to bring with him into the next season. And I'll just tell you that everything that God's teaching you in this stage of your life, you will need in the next stage of your life. There is no season wasted with God. In fact, whenever uh, Jesus multiplies the loaves and the fish, he commanded that they take up the leftovers. Why? Because God never wastes anything. He uses every little fragment piece of our life for the next season. See, I, I think this is so cool because it says in verse 21, David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked him very much and David became one of his armor bearers. Here's what's so crazy is David walks into the house that he's anointed to rule in. He walks into the palace that will one day be his home. He walks into the place to serve in this place. And the way that God introduces him into the next season where he would be king one day is as a servant. And here's the thing is if you can't serve your current employer, don't think that God's going to give you your own place. You got to be willing to take a low place of a servant. And here David is and he comes in and David was in the palace as a servant. And here's what's crazy is Saul was king for 42 years. And of those 42 years, he was only anointed to be king for five years. There's a lot of souls who used to be anointed in one season that aren't anymore that are holding on to things. But the reason why he was able to hold on to it is Saul was part of David's story of becoming who God called him to be. In fact, I will just say this, that the uh, notice that you are anointed and called by God is that you're going to have to serve a difficult employer. You're going to have to serve. I'm sorry, Joseph, you're going to have to go to Potiphar's house first. I'm sorry, David, you're going to have to go and serve Saul first and have spears thrown at you and have difficult things put all around you. Every person you see in the Bible, Jacob with Laban, every person that God used profoundly had to serve a difficult leader. So maybe the problem isn't your boss. Maybe the problem is God's trying to get something out of you through your boss. Has it ever occurred to you that your boss that's giving you the most difficult time is an answer to the prayer of God, make me whatever you want me to be? Have you ever thought of that? And here's the thing is that David learned to be excellent. And because he was excellent, he was able to play before the king. Here's the thing is that I think we've got a lot of people that go on, well, I'm praying it works out and I'm, I'm praying that I'm anointed. I'm blessed and highly favored, but you ain't excellent with anything. You do your job halfway. And you wonder why God's not opening doors. You're anointed, but you're not excellent. And it's when our anointing meets excellence that God begins to open doors. Whatever you do, do it the best as done to the Lord. When I worked at Sonic, I wanted to be the best car hop that place had ever seen. And and I'm not kidding. I I honored it. I I wanted to memorize people's orders. And here's the thing is that when when a bank came to town and they were opening up, the president of the bank said, I know who I want to hire. There's a car hop down at Sonic. And every time I go there, she serves me. Here's the thing is a lot of our generation, you're too good to do uh, small jobs, jobs that you think are beneath you. When really that's the actual place that God will use to prepare you and propel you into your next season. Then I worked at the at the bank and I didn't want to just do my job and sit at the teller station and then just go. And so I would get done with my work and instead of just scrolling on my phone, I would go over to the loan processors and I would say, hey, is there anything I can do for you? 
And I remember the first time Peggy gave me this big stack of reports and she said, have you ever done a report before? And I said, no, but I promise you this, if you teach me, I'll learn. So she taught me. She went on vacation for two weeks and they said, well, who's gonna take your place for the two weeks? She said, I've got somebody, she's a teller. I served in her job for two weeks. When I did, when I was there, I was doing her job and the VP's loan processor's job. And so when Peggy came back, they told Peggy, Peggy, you don't have a job anymore. Crystal just took your job. I was hired as a teller, but I became the president's loan processor. And it wasn't because I was anointed. It was because I was anointed and excellent. It was because I didn't squander away a season. What would happen if you began to show up to work and decide I'm gonna be the best in my field. I'm gonna be the best teller this bank has ever had. I'm gonna be the best hairdresser this, this salon has ever had. I'm gonna be the best person at cleaning houses. When I vacuum, my lines are gonna be perfectly straight. I, I wanna ask you this every day when I leave work, this is the question I ask, did I give God my best? And, and I don't just ask that question because I'm a pastor. I asked that question when I left Sonic and I asked that question every day when I left the bank. Why? Because my employment place had changed, but my employer was always the same. My employer was the Lord. Are y'all getting something out of this? The third thing that God wants to teach you in this season with your job is the Goliath problem. The Goliath problem teaches you submission. In 1 Samuel 17, 32 through 37, David says this, don't worry about this Philistine. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul said. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy and he's been a man of war since his youth. Side note, people will always try to project their insecurities onto you. But David persisted and he said, I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. He had never fought a battle once, but the goat was enough to qualify him. Humility was enough to qualify him. And he said, when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If an animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. David was a bad mamma jamma. And he says this on down, says the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. And Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. In this season of submission, this is what you need to learn is to trouble or to torment what's tormenting your leader. Whatever Saul's problem was, David was willing to fight it. Whenever Saul was uh, wrestling with demonic spirits, David was willing to play music that would make the demons flee. When everybody was standing at a battle line and waiting for a Goliath to fall, nobody was willing to go up to the battle line. And David finally realized nobody else is coming. I might as well let God use me because if it's tormenting my leader, it's tormenting me. And so I'll do whatever it takes to help my leader. See, this is where we learn submission. I, I remember whenever we were youth pastors uh, 12 years ago and uh, we were in Sulphur Springs, Texas, and it may have been longer than 12 years ago. I'm 25, so the years start to run together at a certain point. And, uh, and so we were youth pastors and it was a Tuesday night and this kid had showed up to youth group and he told me this, he waited for me afterward. He said, what do I have to do to get on the stage? And I was like, you joker. Uh, I said, okay, I said, you wanna be on the stage? He said, yeah, I wanna be on the stage. And I said, okay, tell you what, you show up, sweep the floors, clean the toilets. You do that for a year, we'll talk about you being on the stage. I thought he wouldn't show up. You know why I think that? Because many people have done the same thing. They still do it today. And I was amazed the next week he showed up. And he wasn't just there, he was sweeping the floors, taking out the trash, doing whatever needed to be done. Fast forward, time goes on, we get ready to plant the church and he felt called by God to come with us. And he said, pastors, what do you guys need? What is the biggest need you need right now? And I said, we need a sound guy. And he said, I'll do that. You'll never have to worry about sound. I'll take care of it. We're loading in at five, getting trailers, 5.30 in the morning, showing up at elementary school. And he was there every week knew I could count on him. He came to us one week as we were starting the church and he said, pastors, what's, what's your big greatest need right now? I said, we need a drummer. We, we don't have a drummer. We just need a drummer. He goes home and he starts watching YouTube videos, buys a drum set with his own money. Didn't turn in the receipt to the church to buy it for him, buys it with his own money and starts teaching himself how to play the drums. And now that boy, that, that boy who became a man is Dustin Red Wallace who played the drums today. 
And he is by far the most excellent, humble, and submitted person we have. And here's the wild part, is our church is now 1,500 people, and he plays, I would say, mostly, uh, anywhere between, I would say, 80 to 100 times a year for us, because 40 Sundays a year, he's here playing. Not only that, he plays for our youth ministry, he plays for sisterhood, he plays, and he is the most faithful person. I know if I call him, I can count on him. And here's the thing, is that as he's been faithful to use his gifts, talents, and abilities, God continues to bless him and favor him. Here's the thing is that a lot of you have gifting, but you're not willing to be submitted. You can't even show up. You signed up to serve in kids classroom, but you won't show up when you're rostered. What would happen if some people stopped saying, well, this is how God can use me. And you came to your leader and said, whatever's tormenting you is tormenting me. And I'm gonna commit myself to get good at whatever's bothering you. Whenever I worked at the bank, I walked into the VP's office and she was upset one day. And I said, what's troubling you, Helen? Tell me, tell me what's the problem. She said, I hate when I show up here and there's no candy in the dishes. And I said, I'll tell you this, every time you come to this bank, I promise you, there will always be candy in those dishes. And I took my goat salary and I went and bought candy. And she didn't just like any candy, she liked turtles, individually wrapped. And you know what? I didn't complain. I didn't turn in my receipt for reimbursement. Every time when our family sacrificed to go buy those turtles, I said, God, thank you for choosing me. I'm gonna torment what's tormenting my leader. And I, I got joy of watching her walk through the lobby and seeing all the candy dishes full. Come on, somebody. A lot of us want God to do big things, but we wanna neglect the goat, neglect the guitar, neglect the thing. Anointing is not enough. And, and I think our workplaces, what would happen? You want to see revival break out in your workplace? Go into work Monday morning, meet with your boss and say, what's tormenting you? What's the biggest problem you have? Because I'm going to solve it. And then you actually do it. And you watch God's hand of favor begin to come on your family, on your life like never before. Why? Because God honors honor. And a lot of us are trying to pray ourselves out of situations that God has providentially put us in to make us into the people that he's called us to be. Why? Because it's for the special purpose and it's for his people to see his light and his glory. And I wanna announce to you that nobody else is coming. Nobody else is coming to that workplace. Nobody else is coming to that home. Nobody else is coming to your business. It's when you decide, God, use me right where I am with my talents, with my abilities, with what I have and watch God do something so amazing in your life. Can I pray for you right where you're at? Father, I thank you that you're calling us higher. Lord, I thank you that in this house, Lord, we've got hundreds of reds in this house, Dustin Red Wallaces here in this house. Lord, people that are willing to be excellent, humble, and submitted. That Father, right now we say yes to whatever you're asking us to do. There's no task too small or it's no thing too big. There's nothing off limits. Lord, right now, every person here, Lord, we just bless our employers. Lord, we bless our bosses. We bless our place of employment. Lord, what an honor it is to work there. God, I thank you that as we go in on Monday morning, we don't go in with an attitude of, I have to do this, but I get to do this. Let us serve our bosses as we're serving the Lord. Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And every person who believed it said, amen. If you're hearing the sound of my voice and you say, Crystal, I've never asked Jesus into my life. Maybe you've made some mistakes, you've fallen away, but today you wanna give your life back to him. I wanna encourage you this, that God has never quit on you. People may have quit on you, but God never has. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation, meaning we don't have to put it off to tomorrow, that God wants our yes today. So if you're hearing the sound of my voice, every head bowed, every eye closed, I wanna ask you a question. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Maybe you wanna give him your life for the first time, or maybe you wanna rededicate your life to him. Will you just lift your hand on the count of three so I know who I'm praying with? One, two, three. Lift your hand in this place. Amen, amen, amen. Can we pray this prayer together as a church family? Say this, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Take my sins, and by your grace, I take your righteousness. I make you the Lord of my life. I hold nothing back. In Jesus' name. And every person who believed it said, amen, amen. Can we give it up for every person who just prayed that prayer? 
I'm so proud of you. If you prayed that prayer today, we wanna celebrate with you. Uh, can you do me a favor? Text the keyword decided to 903-634-7135. A member of our team would love to follow up with you, get you a Bible or anything you might need as you begin this incredible journey of faith, amen? Thank you so much for listening to this message. A special thanks to those who give generously to One Church. It's because of you that lives are being impacted all over the world. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit subscribe for more messages like this. Share this with a friend, post it on social media, and be sure to tag us at I Am One Church. Thanks again for listening.